This is Jim Cornette. You're listening to InYourHeadOnline.com, and you made the right choice. Welcome to In Your Head Wrestling Radio. I'm the internet icon, the pride of the pilgrims, handsome Jackie Jones, a special on the road with Dan edition here of In Your Head with MMA and UFC pioneer, multiple time champion, Hall of Famer. He's a true legend in the world of fighting. Dan, the beast Severin. How you doing? Well, you forgot and all about good guy. Come on now, Jack. You got to get all your, get all that information. Come on. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I was going to say that till after the interview. So, uh, so I know. Oh, for okay. sure. All right. <laughs> but yeah, d- definitely all around good guy, Dan, Dan Severin. I think it, just doing this uh, makes you a good guy. Well, so, how many more people are, are, are going to uh, do an interview uh, while they're driving in the middle of the night to, <laughs> to their next uh, destination? Come on now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That makes you a hell of a dude, I think. So, where are you driving to? Are you are you allowed to say? I don't have that. There's no problem with it. It's uh, I left Coldwater, Michigan, and I've been route to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I roughly, uh, I'll say, approximately a twelve-hour drive from Coldwater. Wow. So is that is that how always how you uh you travel? You always uh do by uh drive. No. No, I, that, no, no, I mean, I mean, usually shorter distance around me. Yeah, I usually have a vehicle. Right. This is just something that just came together. I'll say relatively shortly, but at the same token, uh, Jack, how do I put this? Uh, I, I very rarely go into an area and do just one thing. Once right. I have a primary reason going into an area, then I will pick up secondary. To elaborate on that, I am going to Tulsa, Oklahoma, to perform a professional wrestling act. <laughs> very so, cool, very cool. Yeah. And now that so, I'm going to do that, mm-hmm. I've already got a couple of uh, parachutes set up and a couple of uh, Buffalo Wild Weeks. And uh, before I know it, uh, I'll probably have a seminar on top of all that. Oh, I have a speaking engagement with a uh, local boys hold as well. Very cool. So you stay, stay busy, and that's also very smart. While you're there, you might as well uh, do a bunch of other stuff. Yep. So, and, is and, it... And I thought make a video of my time. I do an interview with my time with that. Exactly. Got to put it up. <laughs> Everything together. <laughs> so, um, now you retired from, from, from uh, MMA, right? Um, well, let's say that... Or semi-retired. I, I think... You know, I may have to eventually admit to that. Uh, I, mean, I, I basically retired at one point in time, uh, mm-hmm. but I simply said I'm retiring, but I'm retiring with a clause. I simply said I'll, that uh, if one of these three guys would ever just step up the plate, and three guys were ready to go, were Mark Colbert, were Ken Shabuck, and Royce Grayson. Well, Mark Colbert is off the list now. He's had a couple artificial hips replaced. Mm-hmm. And you know, had some health issues, so he's he's off the list. Uh, but you know, Ken at the hoist, you know, they they've uh, they've got a couple matches, you know, and uh, so they're still viable commodities. I don't wish to go get any of the young pups. The young pups, I mean, it's uh, the hardest thing for any professional athlete is to to be know when to move along. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that's still a dream match, even though you guys have fought before, but you, you and Ken Shamrock one more time, or you and Hoist Gracie. Well, I think they would be actually pathetic at best even today, but, uh, you know, but there's still, there's, there's nostalgia to them. They are still marketable. So I, I talked to Ken uh, last week. We had him on the show. And, no, um, say it isn't so. <laughs> I did. And uh, he said, I asked him about you. And uh, he he wanted to, he said some some maybe not the greatest things about you. Uh, I wrote down the quote so I didn't misquote him. He said uh, I went I went to bat for this guy to to put fight on. I was going to be the main event, and they were looking for an opponent. And I said let's use Dan Severn. There's the uh, there's the rubber match there, and they didn't want to use him. They didn't believe he he they didn't believe he would sell tickets. And I told uh, them because of the history we had, I could sell this fight. I could fight anybody and put butts in the seats. So I went to bat for him and said we could do it. Then he talks about uh, uh, some other stuff about going to court, about uh, testing positive and stuff. So uh, um, is that the, do you have the same recollection of, of this? 
Well, Jack, I mean, I wasn't with at those meetings. If, sure, if that's, that is that's indeed, very true. And at the same token, that's all basically irrelevant in the sense that. So what if he did do all that? Mm-hmm. The 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 fate is when it came out, he actually, he agreed to fight me, and he agreed to fight me and uh, signed the letter of intent, took. Uh, a monetary deposit securing that simply to take another batch two days before. Mm-hmm. You gotta realize again, I can't tell you the exact dates, but it was. Sure. We are, the, the show that we were supposed to have was slated for a Sunday. And all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's making these, these uh, whatever, these Twitter announcements, got a, got a big announcement to be. We had bought thinking he's about to announce our batch, and then lo and behold, he announces his batch against Boyce Gracie and Bellator. And I go, huh, that's going to be kind of a busy schedule if he's going to do Boyce on a Friday night and me on a Sunday uh, evening. That's, uh, that's a kind of a busy boy. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I bring it to the attention of the uh, company I'm working with. Because, you know, the company I'm working with, this, this UR network, uh, I mean, they had, no, they had no clue into the world of mixed martial arts. I'm the guy that basically helped them pull off the show that they did pull off. But basically, you know, I got contact with them. I go, you do realize that uh, Ken is made an announcement he's fighting on the Bellator show on a Friday night. And they're like, well, yeah, so... That should not affect the Sunday. I go, oh, let me elaborate here for you. If you get so much as a tank nails, minimum of a 30 day suspension. Mm-hmm. And I go, what's that going to do for your show that takes place on Sunday? And like, oh, so basically they make the phone call. Speak to Ken, and Ken tells them, that, uh, well, just move it back, move it back, you know, what, what, for a few weeks. And, you know, at first, you know, he was, he was arrogant. He said, I'll fight, I'll fight, uh, Hoist on a Friday, and I'll fight, uh, or actually move back by one week, I'll be, I'll fight Hoist one week, and I'll, and I'll fight Dan the next week. And does Dan have any problem with that? <laughs> and when that comes, so we just, that's what I said. I go, no, that yeah, doesn't have a problem with this whatsoever. That's, I go, but you, Mr. Company, you are that network. You might have a problem because he does get that hanged out. He's out for a bit of 30 days, so you might want to back it back by at least 30 days. So anyway, lo and behold, they do back it up. He does his batch. Oh, yeah, he gets his boo-boo. He gets his suspension. <laughs> but then he gets a violation on top of that. So, mm-hmm. you know, I guess uh, Jack... Uh, at what point do, do, am I supposed to say, I'm sorry to you, Ken. Ken, I'm sorry that you, uh, you failed your, uh, your, your, your test. Uh, uh-huh. you know, Ken, I'm sorry you failed it for the second time. I'm sorry that you not only failed it for controlled substances, but you also failed it for, uh, for, uh, so gosh, what, what was it that goes with, uh, paint or stuff like this? Uh, uh, you basically failed, he failed, he failed, he failed a couple of different things. Mm-hmm. But you just because you take the fake kills and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, yeah, I guess, I, I guess I, I'm sorry because Ken is such a screw up. <laughs> Have you yourself or, ever, as, uh, I like to, you as I like to say, is Ken the sham, Ken <laughs> Uh Have you yourself had uh, failed any drug tests uh, for, for fighting? No, sir. Mm hmm. In fact, if you look at uh, out of the first three UFC Hall of Famers, only one of us has ever tested positive. Would you like to go out on a list there, Jack, as to <laughs> who that might be? Uh, it might uh, be someone we're talking about. I'm not sure. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> it, yeah. But, yeah, I pride mm-hmm. myself in the fact that I'm lifetime chemical free. I, I do work sure. with kids. I would mm-hmm. actually have a little bit more respect for kids. If, I mean, you know, he's got to check the past. You know, he's been in and out of cold for things of nature, and he'll be the first to admit to it. So, so well, why don't you just admit to 
you know, you, you, you use stuff, stuff like that as well. And mm-hmm. then when you're off talking to kids, just, just say, do as I say and not as I did. Mm-hmm. Because I did this, these were some of my repercussions. At least hold it for what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't, you, know, you can't turn back the clock of time or anything, sure. but uh, that's how it, when people ask me all the time, if you could turn back the clock of time, would you do anything different? No, I can't turn back the clock of time, so I'll live with all my decisions that I made, whether they were good or bad. Mm-hmm. Now, in the early days of UFC, um, I, I watch it from the beginning, and I, I, I like kind of the Wild West days when there was no like weight classes, and you'd have like a you know six hundred pound sumo guy versus like a uh, you know a karate guy or something. It was it was just it was cool. Uh, when you, you first can, you could you could make a star do that thing because you know the first time that they go out there, you know they might win the match. Okay, that was cool. All the, mm-hmm. You know, you see that they're they're, they're they're there for the second match, and they're they're a little. You know, they're, they got a little mouse baby over their eye, a little blood crustacean out of them, but they're ready to throw down again. But by that third batch, they look like they're pulled through a dot hole backwards, and they're ready to throw down again. People were, were nuts for that, that at that point in time because mm-hmm. it was crazy to think that you're fighting three men and a two-hour pay-per-view. Same two-hour pay-per-view that still runs to this day where you fight one opponent. Then you had to fight three. Mm-hmm. How grueling was that to, to fight the tournaments? Well, I mean, it's, I guess it depends on how you prepared. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, played, uh, I think my UFC 5 was one of the shortest, uh, I think, shortest episodes or a length of time it took to take out three people and uh, win. Mm-hmm. So when, when you first, uh, were you contacted to be in the first UFC at all? No, no, I did, I did not even know it existed. Uh, you have to go back in time to realize that uh, pay-per-view events were not prevalent like they are today. The way that the cell phone and that whole industry has mm-hmm. moved along, I mean, it's uh, back at that 90, uh, uh, 93, because uh, the very first UFC was, was uh, I think, December 1993, it was, uh, pay-per-views were only uh, prevalent in major cities. So if you were in a state like Michigan, they might be played in, in Detroit. They might be played in Saginaw. They might be played in, in Flint. But I, mm-hmm. you know, I have lived out in little, uh, little Coldwater, Michigan, which is a food uh of a place. You know, we, we're not getting that pay-per-view, so I didn't know it. It's just there's a buddy of mine out of Detroit who watched the first couple UFCs that... Uh, he copies of our old VHS tape and shows it to me and says, hey, I mm-hmm. think you ought to do this. I've seen people get soccer kicked in the face, teeth that fly out, and I'm like, uh, these are not exactly skills I possess. <laughs> right. said, look, at this, look at this skinny little guy do it. Just, of course, he was before the always great. And I, and I thought, well, mm-hmm. a man close enough to throw down a uh I can either step back and get out of range or close the distance before he gets any real mustard out of any shot. That was actually the bite that, that I had. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what's your background in fighting before the UFC? Um, I've never, Jack, I have never been in a fight in my entire life, but I have been a competitor my entire life, and that's a different mindset. Okay. Now, I never would have pursued boxing or kickboxing Boy, die because I don't possess those those skills. But I was a very successful wrestler, mm-hmm. and I said to do that if I can avoid being kicked in the punch and I can get my opponent clinched. Oh, they will never see the light of day again. And that is really, well, I guess, is the case that happened. I'd say at most of my matches. Mm-hmm. Is that how you always looked at your your matches and in, uh, in UFC? Not necessarily as a fight, as you're competing and trying to 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 best them, as opposed to like fight and beat them up. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I I, I did not have to create any kind of animosity, any cause any anger. Uh, yeah, I only ever had really one match where I knew that I was going to get a really evil person, and that was Take Abbott. 
you know, after watching him at several of his matches and, and how he conducted himself, uh, I just looked upon uh, there's uh, when he steps into a cage, evil will have begotten a greater evil. You know, there, that's what I mean by that is that, you know, there's a lot of people that don't know how to turn the switch on and become something else. And any true professional athlete knows how to turn things on and how to turn things off. And I know how to throw that switch. I'm the nicest guy in the world. Uh, you know, and if you look at, 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 at my average domestic career, it speaks for itself. Shake your head before, shake your head after. You know, whether it be a six-minute match, a nine-minute match, or a 15-minute match, I'm coming at you with everything I got within the rules, the confines of other rules. I realized that just you only had two rules at the time. No biting, no eye touch. That was it. Yeah, when they had like no rules like that, um, so when you're in a match with somebody, did, did you ever get like someone who was, uh, I don't know, try to knee in the groin or, or anything like, like that? Oh, sure. Yeah, that, 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 I, I had things like that being attempted, but, uh, you yeah. know, Kind of was like, okay, to so hold it against them. No, they're, they're just utilizing the rules. To right. benefit. So, and, what was uh, it about? What was it about Tank Abbott that uh, that made you oh, think? Right. He was well, to one of one of the very first matches I ever watched, I saw him uh, basically knocked out like a four hundred pound sumo with one strike. Mm-hmm. And as this guy laid there helpless, and his body was it stiffening up, going into in commotion, and while the man laid there helpless. Tank Abbott had the audacity to uh, literally uh, launch himself and, and, and hammer fist this guy while he laid there helpless like that. And I'm like, you son of a bitch. Yeah. And I, I, and I even told myself, I, did, I saw that, I go, if I ever get an opportunity to have your cage, I will beat you within an inch of your life for doing something like that. I, I I'm not a aggressive person after people. Mm-hmm. I actually, if, if that, that type of person, I always stood up for the, for the little guy, mm-hmm. the helper, mm-hmm. the protector. And I see that even I have five children of my own, and, and all of them have that same trait. And that's a wonderful trait to have, that those that don't know how to sit for themselves, others will step in there and just and say, no, don't do that. Um, we, don't so, have, we don't have enough people like that. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's very admirable. And um, so, when you were um, when you did uh, face uh, Tank, uh, how did that fight go? How did that match go? Well, it was at the uh, the, the that was called the Ultimate Open, Ultimate, the, the very first time that they uh, that the UFC brought back various tournament champions and or runner ups as a mm-hmm. the eight man tournament format. And I faced uh, Tank Abbott in round number two. It was actually the first time that uh, they even implemented time frames. Where your first match was 15 minutes, second mm-hmm. match was 20 minutes, and the third match in the finals, I think, with a total of uh, 30 minutes with a five minute overtime if needed to be. Mm-hmm. And basically, I beat Tank Abbott for 20 minutes. Uh, so what was that experience like for you to actually fight with some type of, uh, uh, not necessarily wanting to hurt someone like, uh, permanently, but what, you know, wanting to oh, do no, it. No, no, uh, no, I was, I was, I was looking to hurt her permanently. I, basically, I just, I just to teach was able lesson. to take him down and I more or less humiliated him in mm-hmm. front of all of his people and exposed him for really what it was. I just mm-hmm. took it down and I just beat down him. And I beat him. That I beat him. I took the ball. It's not that that was going to finish him. Mm-hmm. I just, just kept it down. Just as long as you stayed active, they're not going to stand up. Well, I mean, basically, I just don't, don't beat him. Like I just punched him my tight block. Mm-hmm. I'm going I'm to throw as many hammer strikes with my right hand as I can with that because it's tired. I go with my left hand when I get tired. I start throwing some knees. My right knee is back to start. I start throwing some left knees. If I forget where I'm at, just start all over again. Mm hmm. 
What was he? What yeah, kind of? At, 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 at the time, at the time, they called that the physically most violent match that they had ever seen in the U.S. history. Now, get it? That lapsed since then, but at the time, that's what it was dubbed at. Did Did he say anything to you after the match? Yeah, well, not that to me, but his comment that he uh, said afterwards, uh, thanks to Press, was that he felt like he got raped by Freddie Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I think actually one of our uh, listeners on the uh, yeah, actually uh, Jay uh, on our Facebook, he he wrote that he said uh, I felt like I was being raped by Freddie Mercury by Tank Abbott yeah. after his loss to uh, <laughs> to Dan Severin. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> what what kind well, of person I mean, was? I, I, ironically, when I was first was first when I first heard this, mm-hmm. I think I'm thinking well, I, I know that's what cause of it, but it, they took it. I did that stuff with Fred Murphy was either. So I had to go <laughs> ask somebody, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I get down to it. I do it with no <laughs> down to it. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, what kind of person was Tank outside of it? I don't know if you were around him much outside of... No, I, uh, no, don't know him. Don't know him. Don't know him don't, 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 don't whatsoever to, to say one, one way or the other. But uh, at the same token, I do know about him because uh, he made the claim... That he has one of the biggest, he basically claimed that he has probably a bigger rap sheet than all the other UFC fighters combined. And uh, I could add uh, Big John McCarthy, Nelly the LAPD. Uh, if that was true, I, I guess John did take a little bit look into his background. And yeah, he has a lot of drunk and disorderly caught up uh-huh. in his band at a lot of different bars. And to me, it's like, there is no fighting. There is no. I should let me rephrase that. There is no honor in fighting anymore out in the general population. Mm. If you get the best of me, now I'm going to go get my gun. That's what people do nowadays. So it's been like, uh, you know, it's better not get to fight because there's always going to be something bigger, better, and if they're not bigger, better, uh, they can just pull out their friends with the weapons and they'll take care of you at that point in time. That's why right. there's just no honor. There was a time mm-hmm. that if you if you and I had a problem, we step outside, we dumped each other a couple times, we go and we have a beer, case closed. That's not the way with the world we work it now. Mm-hmm. So when when your friend showed you the VHS tape of of the of the UFCs, so how how did yeah. you get involved? Then did you contact UFC and say like uh, I want to be in this? Was, is there well, any type yeah, of audition I mean, was, or anything? Uh, well, the, there were actually uh, there were full page ads in all these various martial arts magazines that uh, said something like that. You want to be a, but just you know, I'm just passing the uh, uh, Indiana into Illinois now. Okay, so just do the update because uh, you know, how my travels here on the road with the beast. So uh, they had these different uh, full page ads. It just said, do you want to be a. Uh, a a cage fighter, do you want to be a uh, an ultimate fighter and then fill it there on out? So I basically I filled it on out, said that I didn't but nobody ever made a full uh no one ever called it back. Well I happened to be I, I my first profession was professional wrestling as of the ninety two Olympics. Mm-hmm. And uh I had to be going out on a professional the card in Los Angeles. So a few phone calls were made on my behalf uh, that somehow made it to Art Dave, the creator of the Ultimate Fighter Championship. And he came out to watch my professional match. I don't want to watch professional or not, but I, I had to be voted against uh, one of the Legion of Doom uh, uh, characters, and I was voted against Hawk of mm-hmm. Legion of Doom. And when our match was done, I came over, I, I, I was introduced to uh, Art Davy, and the very first words out of his mouth was, you do realize what we do is real, don't you? And, you know, that, that wanted to, you know, uh, first there was a bubble there about professional athletes, but uh, I said, yes, I do. And then he's like, well, what's your professional fight record? Well, I don't have one of those. You know, what's your amateur fight record? Well, I don't have one of those either. And then he's kind of like, well, what are your skills? He started talking down to me. And to be honest, I told him, uh, I, I just, 
I just, I stood back out of my watch. I mean, I have a pro fight record. I mean, I have an average fight record. I go, I said, I said, but I said, I've been an average wrestler for 26 years. And he, he's like, uh, he says, but it's an amateur wrestler has a lot of rules and regulations. And I said, it sure does. It was maybe, I said, inside the United States. I said, but you'd be surprised what you can do when you are in foreign soil and have a foreign opponent. It'll be the closest thing you'll ever see What if your UFC style match. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, I, I'll just say, I think that was really about it. Um, Realistically, I think I was just a, a last minute filler. Mm-hmm. And because uh, by the time I, I got the phone call, yeah, I, I, I've always kept a very busy life. I only trained for five days, an hour and a half a day. Wow. Never traded, never traded a single strike, never traded a single legitimate submission. I had Al Snow and two other professional wrestling protégés. They had one pair of boxing gloves between them. And so one guy would go and he would punch, kick, do whatever submissions he could make, make up. Then when he got tired, he'd give it to the next guy. The next guy, and I basically just either stand or age, close this clips, take down, throw down, throw out average rush of moves, turn them a little bit illegal, make them scream or squat. That was my trade cap. It was actually nobody else I think in the world could have ever done what I did and then come back and get the results I did as well. Mm-hmm. So, so um, after that, that first uh, UFC that you were in and you, you win the, uh, the tournament, uh, wh- wh- what were the people from UFC like after that? Were they, did they treat you differently? Like, oh, you know, we got to you know, use you more? Like, what was their reaction? Well, well, I mean, it just like my contract, they couldn't get rid of me. As long as you finish, finish at the top two, which I did, mm-hmm. um, they can't get rid of you. You automatically get to come back to the next tournament. So basically, I finished at the top two. I mean, when, well, my very first match out there, you know, I, I, I basically I horrified everybody because I pulled off a couple belly to back two plays, but in a professional's world, they'll call it mm-hmm. German suplex. They never see anyone physically rag down up a human being the way mm-hmm. that I did. And finish finish about off. And uh, you know, at UFC five, I actually took out thirty two days of my life by trained to become a UFC double smart fighter. So uh, for that one you said you trained to become a UFC uh fighter. So yeah, I took um, out, I took out thirty two days of my life, yes. Yeah, so uh, for that, do you specifically train for UFC, like uh, for defense and yes. maybe some type of uh, something to, to finish th- someone? Well, I, I, I practice striking, I practice submissions, anything and everything. Weightlifting, conditioning. Now you realize there, there were no manuals, there were no DVDs or A tracks or anything of any sure. kind. You, you basically made, up, made it up as you went. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and now, that, and, yeah, and now MMA really is just its own fighting style. Like people train specifically for MMA. Correct. And uh, but you'd be one of those people that would uh, that kind of pioneered uh, that style. Well, yeah, actually, I, I think I will, you know, I'll, I'll say I'm a little bit cut, more cutting edge. I mean, the reality is, you know, Jack, I. I I did about the sport of amateur wrestling since 1969. That's why I started back in seventh grade. Mm-hmm. By ninth grade, I was teaching it. But between my ninth grade and the summer and going into tenth grade, I won my first national title. Okay, so that's like from 69 by 71, teaching it by 72, I won my first national title, and you were born then. Mm hmm. What what brought you into no, in, no, no, into no. Rest- that, 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 that was a question. Oh, you were born I said, was- I said, I, I, I started teaching wrestling. I should be. I started my wrestling career in '69. Mm-hmm. I started teaching it to others by '71, and by '72, I won my first national title. And you were born when? I'm born '76. 
I, I, but, yeah. I've, never, I've never met you before, but I've always assumed that because I'm older. I've been competing longer than what most people have been alive. So mm-hmm. to do what I did, started in 1994, to start a cage fighting career just before turning 37 years of age, nobody starts a career then. They retire from it. I started a career, only plan on doing one, but one went okay. Why did I do another? First year, fifth year, 20 years later. Nobody will ever do what I did. Lifetime, chemical free, at only two training camps in a 20 year span. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's honestly amazing. Did, did, how, how are you physically? Um, from all those years of both uh, yeah, MMA you, and uh, and professional Eric, wrestling. If you, if you saw me right now, mm-hmm. you you all right. I don't look like a. I, you gotta realize I'm headed towards fifty years of age. Mm-hmm. I don't look like a fifty year old age, uh, man. I don't act like a fifty year old man. I, I met you at a um, uh, NWA Wrestling uh, Legends Fan Fest, and uh, that that right? was a few years ago. Um, okay. well, probably more longer than I think it was, but probably eight years ago, but I mean, you look, you looked great then. And so, uh, but, uh, how about injury wise? Like, um, how are well, you I'm, doing? I'm, I, I've won the storm. I've won the storm. Well, I mean, I, you know, so I've been hurt along the way, but I, I've been hurt worse. I've been hurt worse in my, my average domestic career. I've been hurt worse in my professional wrestling career than in my cage fighting career. Cage fighting actually is about the safest thing I've done out of those three. But why do you think that Which is? is almost, well, I mean, it's easy when you look at in mm-hmm. a comparison, say, to professional wrestling. In a uh, you know, comparison of professional wrestling to mixed martial arts, mixed martial arts, you don't have to make a match last for a certain period of time. Mm-hmm. You know, basically, the, the, premise, the premise, what will happen is the promoter will say, hey, guys, give me uh, 10 to 12 minutes worth of action, and uh, Jack, you get to go over, but you have to cheat uh, by pulling Dad's trunk to put the feet on ropes so we can keep Dad looking strong as a baby face. And that's about the only guideline that they will probably give you. And then you and I sit back there and we figure out the best. We should be know that it's going to be 10 to 12 minutes of give and take of me allowing you to pick me up and to slam me, to hit me with uh, uh, orbs to the back, European uppercuts, chops, punches, you know, repeat over and over again. And it's, uh, people don't realize how much trauma that takes on the body. But you look at like the WWE, when I was working with them, the average contract was 187 matches a year. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't count, even include travel to or travel back up. So you can easily see where you're on the road 200 plus days a year. That constant pounding uh, takes a toll. There's a, there, there's a reason why there's such a high mortality rate in professional mm-hmm. wrestlers. I've already outlived three of my cage fighting opponents and almost 30 of my professional wrestling partners and none of them are as old as me. Yeah. It just has nothing to do with lifestyle and lifestyle choice. Well, what are some of the things like uh, you had to stay away from uh, you know, to avoid some of the some of the, like the pitfalls of professional wrestling. I guess, but what 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 that? Uh, well, stay away from? Yeah, yeah. What was you know some of the things that you saw other wrestlers do that you stay you stayed away from? Well, I mean, the, the, the temptations, the steroids, stuff like that are, are, are always there. I mean, it's uh, I've actually had different uh, different business groups actually approach me after they saw, like, for example, to talk about mixed martial arts for a moment. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when there wasn't, you know, there, there, nobody was trying to trade. Get back in, in that, that pioneer, uh, the old bar there, uh, nobody was like, there were no drug tested at that point in time. I was approached by a couple of different groups that said that, that, hey, we'll take care of all of your, your bills, stuff like this. Uh, all you got to do is trade and, uh, 
at the form, and we just want a small percentage of the winnings. Uh, but as part of this bill, because of your age, that this Joshua levels must be declined. We want you to get get with our doctor, so he gives you like this, this, and this. We got to figure at your height and your weight already. We can probably get you up to about three and a quarter. Rip at about six percent body fat. You'll have thirty-five to forty percent more power. I call guys. If I had thirty-five to forty percent more power, I'd be pull up body parts off of people and I'd be beat them with a bloody stump. But it'd be I I declined. Mm-hmm. You know I, you know, it, it was definitely. You know, but I I've been. You know, I, I'll say I've kind of been like that. I can't say I've been a good at you show all my life, but I've been kind of that boy scout for most of my life. Yeah, uh, along and, and those. It's, it's yeah. always been the, been the caretaker for most of my most mm-hmm. my buddies. If I went with a group of guys, that was a face stuff like this. I faced it was a guy that usually was the designated driver. They took that little data back. And some of them I'd have to break back to, you know, whether it be at my parents' place or if I had to take back to my college place because they weren't in no shape to go back home to where they had to be because I didn't want, you know, didn't want them to be see the, you know, that, that state that they were in. Mm-hmm. Um, along the lines when you're saying about uh, the temptations of, of taking steroids, um, when we had Ken on, he also talked about that uh, Vince didn't like your look. He said wh- when you took your shirt off. I don't know if you remember anything about this. And uh, was that was there a temptation there to you know uh, to be like more ripped in, in, when you were in WWF? Uh, no, no. I, you know, it's that's where that's where Vince McMahon has his old double standards. You know, mm-hmm. he has his wellness policy in mm-hmm. place. And he, you know, he wants these uh, athletes not to be doing certain things. And yet, the same token, as long as you're uh, pulling in the money, mm-hmm. as long as you're doing what, what he wants you to do, I'm pretty sure he just turns a blind eye. And, and at the same token, he himself has that busted. Mm-hmm. We're taking steroids. So it's a little bit of a hypocritical type of thing, don't you think? Yes, very, very much so. Um, so. Uh, what what was Vince like towards you uh, when you went to WWF? No, I mean, I, I was treated good. Mm-hmm. I'll say I was treated good at the beginning. I mean, it used to be well with stuff like that. But then, um, you know, they did not know what to do with me. Part of that reason and. And these are things that can't know go about, only people who do about it was me. I, I actually had the, the first and only uh, basically uh, open contract with the WWF. I, 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 I'm restricted. I could work for anybody, including WCW and ECW. They both existed at that time. Wow. And so, I mean, any, anybody else, go Coast to Boston, The Rock, The Undertaker, they can only work for one company. I had the only unrestricted knowledge at the same token. You don't go and fight the head. He just, you know, I was mm-hmm. working for probably 35 different promotions inside the NWA for the National Wrestling Alliance alone. I thought mm-hmm. about what I was doing with the, uh, with the uh, WWE that's going to be WWF at the time. Yeah. On top of what I was doing with the UFC, on top of any other promotion, because I was re- quite restricted to all of the above. I go with Freddie, but, but then I did not wear any kind of goofy outfits. I didn't do any kind of goofy finishes. I went out there as, as the beast that way. Mm-hmm. I did, conducted myself as such. Mm-hmm. Did they did they suggest any type of um, gimmick change or, or or nicknames or anything besides uh, what you already had? Well, yeah, I mean, the WWF, uh, yeah, yeah, they, they, they got a creative team that would be the cycle of a professional sport is if you're a baby face, that turns you to heel, if you're a heel, that turns you to baby face, it's just the cycle. It's just going. 
And so I basically was looked upon as basically kind of a uh, baby face, but, you know, no, no, not just meant to be face. I just was kind of like a play jade for the same outfit. Then I wore the other championship, I got wear it the uh, professional wrestling ring, and just got cut any kind of promos, go down there, take care of business. Got uh, Jim Cordette, who's my, my uh, mouthpiece. You know, he's carrying a couple of belts out to the ring. I've carried another couple of belts. That's when the UFC just realized who was the guy that probably got that more exposure than anybody else. When the UFC basically was at unknown commodity. Mm-hmm. Even with Ken side out, Ken did promote nothing to do with the UFC. I'm coming out there with Jim Cornette with four belts, three for the UFC at the NWA belt. So yep. it, it's just uh, the UFC got an awful lot of promotion out of the, you know, mm-hmm. on a weekly basis, be it who knows how many days of uh, people, households. Mm-hmm. So but, but basically, uh, I don't know, I think it went up to a little bit of a tangent. But uh, I think what, what, what happened there was that, okay, but the, the character aspect, it, it changes. That is probably what led to the, uh, the party of the way. Because, uh, you know, I was pitch me the idea of they wanted, me, they wanted to put 666 across my forehead for the mark of the people. And wanted really? to be an undertaker to sight. And I basically put my hands up like a key, made a little whistle noise. I go, wait, guys, time out. Not going to happen. I mm-hmm. live in small town USA. I'm not going to have any repercussions to my family, nor to my businesses, nor to me for doing a gimmick like this. And they even said, do you know how much money to make doing this? I go, I already made money. That's not why I'm here. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it basically, you know, just that uh, you know, one of the road agents said, well, you know, Dan, we could, uh, we could start using your phone. Dan, what do you mean by that? Well, we could start having you lose matches. I said, oh, you could ask me to lose the match. Now, <laughs> quickly, <Right. laughs> part of the state, anywhere in my contract, I have to lose to any one of your bozos. I said, what's going to happen when I walk into your world of fantasy and turn fantasy into reality? Which one of those clouds do you think that's going to stand a chance? Which one of those clouds do you think that you're going to show up inside that cage? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll just say that, you know, we just, we kind of part of the way, you know, they, they, they want to be called, they, they basically try to bluff me while I call them well. But, you know, at the same token, I do believe that if I made a phone call to, uh, to Vince's office, speak to him, he would take my phone call because the one thing about me, I don't bullshit people. I don't mm-hmm. lie to people. You may or may not like what I say, but you can take it to the bank. Mm-hmm. And, and I can live with my conscience. Mm-hmm. And you think he re- he he's the kind of guy that would respect that? I think so. No. Uh, when you were there, did you have any interaction with Vince Russo? No, uh, no, not really. No, he was kind of like part of his his ship, and uh, he had he had some pretty abstract ideas at that point. I did yeah. not to be able really uh, affected me. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what I'll say what, that some, some uh, of the people that I, you know, at that time, I really did not know that I got to know afterwards. You know, at the time, I probably would have been, could not have stood a bit Russo at that time. Just for all the stuff I see there, uh, that he would come up with some ideas of that wise. But, you know, since that time, I've actually done a couple of interviews with him. It's seemed like we got along just fine. Yeah. Yeah, I just had him on recently, and actually, uh, I can't say I was a big fan of his, uh, a lot of his wrestling, but just him himself, it, he is a very, he's funny and he's a charming guy and seems like yeah, a good guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And um, who were some of the agents that did tell you, I don't know if you want to name names, that did say that to you, like, well, you know, we can have you lose matches. Oh, I, I'll, I'll at least leave those, those innocent for right now. 
Sure, that's fine. Uh, what's your relationship like uh, with um, Jim Cornette? Because I know you wrestled for him uh, before WWF. Uh, he managed. He was your mouthpiece, like in WWE, and just recently yeah. uh, he had his retirement match. Uh, his retirement, retirement match. Yeah, and, with you. And, and he was part of. Uh, you know, he was what I spoke about wrestling mm-hmm. when I first got the WWE strap off of Chris Candido. Mm-hmm. So I've actually, you know, I've encountered. Jim, I think, on at least three, three, maybe, actually, I think, four different points. And to where, I mean, that, you know, he really, uh, he's a throwback of days go by. He really likes wrestling. And so I'll just, I'll, I'll just kind of leave, leave it at that. I mean, to watch him talk mm-hmm. about it, you can see, like, the, the kid in him come on out, you know, he gets so excited when he talks about it. <laughs> yeah, that. definitely. Uh, well, what's your what's your actually background uh, with professional wrestling? Were you a fan of it growing up? I, I watched probably more of it in the and around my junior high time period. It was uh, every Sunday afternoon, big time wrestling. Momo Brazil, the Sheik, into nature to actually to find out it was the, the Sheik's promotion. Mm-hmm. I said, you know, to find that out later in life. But, but you know, we enjoyed it for what it was. Uh, you know, I had several small independent companies approach me through the mid mid eighties and wanted me to serve pro at that time. But had I served pro, I would have lost my average wrestling status and my mm-hmm. address status got too much to me. So I declined the offers, like I said, until nineteen ninety two with when the new rule came down for the IC Olympic Committee that allowed uh, be, to be both average or professional simultaneously. Well, that's what I, I finally turned pro at that time. It was, you know, I, in, my, in my mind, I was thinking it might be my only opportunity to ever see what a the lifestyle of a professional athlete might be. So uh, when you got in, uh, who trained you? I know you mentioned Al Snow, but did he train you for professional wrestling or just for... for No, but uh, the person who who is actually responsible for taking me there and being part of it uh, is a a gentleman by the name of Dennis Casper, which is his real name. Denny Cass was his worker, professional wrestling. He was a legitimate... A uh, Greco Roman wrestler, a freestyle wrestler, and he was the uh, later in life, he was the uh, president of the Michigan Wrestling Club. I was the head wrestling coach for the Michigan Wrestling Club. I coached at Arizona State, coached at Michigan State, and then I met uh, Dennis, Dennis while being the coach at the Michigan Wrestling Club. And so when we would meet, usually about once a month, about the you know, club uh, responsibilities. Once we were done with uh, the, the business I had, I would pick his brain for 15, 20 minutes afterwards. And finally, when this new rule came down, he said, well, he, he painted probably the darkest, curious picture ever of the professional wrestling business. And he said to think about it over the weekend. And if I still wanted to, but to that Monday, he would take me to this place. Well, this place was El Stowe's body slavers gym at Lima, Ohio. Mm-hmm. So, um, what was it? What was the actual training like uh, for you in uh, professional wrestling? Uh, well, it was basically just twice a week. I was traveling from Coldwater, Michigan to Lima, Ohio, uh, three-hour workouts, and uh, the, I aggressive. I aggressively went after it, and uh, you know, it just. It, 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 it really bothered me when guys would be standing in the ring there and just BS about nothing. I, I kind of like, I, I just try to like, nicely say, guys get out of the ring and BS out here. I beat Peter to this ring to the point that basically uh, Al has four old ring posts in his uh, gym and I basically uh, brought them off of him and made my own ring just so I could keep Traded in my old facility, mm-hmm. and they keep going to his place twice a week. And then whenever he teach me, I would just be traded that much more on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. I, um, I, I, it was yeah. not about all that long before 
doing the first of my matches and then uh, doing my first of my matches using my real name, using my real amateur wrestling credentials. And uh, Al Bay had uh, one wrestler, a female wrestler by the name of Candy Devine, watched my match. And at the time, she was uh, dating a Tom Burton, excuse me, Tom Burton, you know, a.k.a. the Dirty White Boy, who mm-hmm. was also one of the coaches for this Japanese uh, group known as the UWFI. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I'll just say that, uh, you know, after yeah, that can divide, three days later, I get a phone call from Tom Burton. Ten days later, I'm down in uh, Nashville, Tennessee for a tryout. And, uh, you know, 30 days later, I'm in Tokyo, Japan. Not a clue as to what I'm doing. But I'm in front of 12,000 people. And uh-huh. I, I, break, I, I break down with my Japanese opponent, much to the, the, the light of all the fans <laughs> that were there. Uh-huh. So what's that experience like going, you know, from uh, here you're training uh, for wrestling and then uh, you're you're in front of this big crowd in Japan? Well, I mean, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that I've, I've had some very unique opportunities come along and, and I've been able to uh, capitalize on yeah. those opportunities. I mean, I really, that's the best way to do it. I mean, even, even now, yeah, I mean, that uh, I, I'm aggressively uh, trying to recruit more and more amateur wrestlers mm-hmm. to my trade facility because of all the opportunities I represent to them. Mm-hmm. Not just to them, but I mean, you know, to those that really want to put forth an effort, but I am, you know, shamelessly going after amateur wrestlers because I can speak their language, I can get a finished product way before a kid with almost any, anybody, any other type of athlete. And again, that, I, what I prefer there is we're a mixed martial artist. You know, it's not by training facility. You know, we train professional wrestlers. We train uh, uh, mixed martial artists. But then also people that just want to get involved in just the mission draft. Mm-hmm. You know, the will always be my very first love to teach uh, the uh, a youth class, youth MMA, but MMA doesn't stand for mixed martial arts, it just stands for modern martial arts. Mm-hmm. And what does that really mean? Just think of it as a glorified physical education class. Yeah. I uh, usually invite us out to me, but I actually have a teaching degree from Arizona State University. Mm-hmm. And uh, I do a lot of substitute teaching, even now. And when mm-hmm. I go to these various schools, then there's a number of occasions where I'm actually go in and I'd be his head coach substitute. And when you go into a class and you've got 25% or more of a class that's not even dressed out and yet to be and yet they're passing. That's where, you know, there's a lot of things that wrong inside the United States here. The way that we continue to lower our bar of expectation. That's why I, I like having my old trade facility because the door that welcomes you also will could say, don't let it hit you on the way out. I can refuse I have right of refusal to, to people just because I, I don't you don't you know, fit into the format of what I'm looking for. And I've had to turn four people away so far. The first three are dead. I, I anticipate that's what probably will happen to the fourth one. Not, not, by, not by me, by any means, but uh, they're just kind of like bad karma type individuals, and they do enough wrong things that uh, uh, I just want to be around them with whatever he goes, goes wrong for them. Mm-hmm. Now, I have a question that about, um, you know, uh, training. Um, uh, you mentioned the youth a bunch of times. So let's say... Um, even if they don't go on to, to, to wrestle professionally or they don't go on to the UFC or, or anything like that, right. well, what what do you think um, just the actual training, what is that, you know, how does that help someone uh, just to become a man, to, uh, to stay out of trouble? Yeah. Like, yeah. what are the things, like, they gain from that? That's perfect. That's a good question. I, I say that if all else fails, that they don't go on to do 
all those different dates. They were not the fighter, they're not the professional wrestler. I will have made my mark by simply by making a better generation. Mm-hmm. I take, and my, my, my clientele is probably 98, 99% younger boys. And I try to turn it into accountable young men. I'll be there at the door as they're coming out in. And they come out in, and, you know, especially out at the beginning, their heads are held out. So they just, I put my arm across, just like the clothes, right? And I stop them. I go, and what are you supposed to do with you come into my training facility? And they're like, oh, they're like, okay, coach, I'm supposed to look you in the eye. They're supposed to say hello or to shake your hand. I go, I got to do that. So I, I do, you know, kids nowadays, they don't, they, they don't have any social skills whatsoever. They almost all of their heads are hanged out. They don't make any kind of eye contact. They don't know how to shake a hand. You know, so I look at that. Uh, if I, their mark is always simply just to do something as little as that. I made the world a better place. Mm-hmm. Um, does that make you proud? You know, when you help, when you know you've helped someone out, like to, to see their progression. Of course it does. I have. I mean, I, I told you before. I have my own five children. I, I, I look at this as just extension of family. Mm-hmm. So that when they do something really good, that they go on, you know, especially if you want to, you know, I, I'll go to some the local. Uh, average rest of that. So I see one of my athletes out there and they pull something on off me, you know, every now and then they don't down the goal without giving the thumbs up or something like that. I mean, that's, that's the greatest recognition I need. Mm. So, um, back to, I back have, to Japan. That, that, that is my job. Just, just let you know, I, my gift, everyone, everyone, I, yeah, I should say that, but everyone doesn't know, but I know that everyone has a gift. Whether or not they know what their gift is, that's that's irrelevant. My gift is I am a good I am a good teacher. Mm-hmm. I started as I said earlier. I started teaching in 1971. It wasn't until 1981 that Arizona State University gave me my sheepskin and said, "Hey, you are officially a teacher." I just kind of smiled as I took the the, the diploma, and uh, so I've only been doing it for decades. Previously, I'm good at what I do. Even I, tonight, before leaving, I worked with a couple uh, MMA guys, and I just going off the phase off of clinches. How do you? I go from from, a, from striking to clinching to take some of out and go right into a submission. And they were they were just being boggled by the simplicity, but they affected us. I'm still teaching stuff now that. Most have never even thought of. I'm not saying that to be braggocious. One mm-hmm. thing that surprised me, I'm not a braggocious person. I state things as facts. And that's why I say that's why I let my record speak for itself. When you look at only four people in the world have over 100 cage fights, I'm one of the four. Mm-hmm. That's only three in the world that have over 100 victories, I'm one of the three. Ironic part is, I have faced the other three, defeated the other three, and the closest one to my age is 15 years by two years. So puts me in a category all by myself. I always told you that I started my career at age 37. I did it like that, chemical free, and I only did two training camps. You find me another human being either alive or deceased that could make that claim. It doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. I am walking history. One day, there will be a movie about me. I know that. I just hope I'm still alive when that comes, comes <laughs> down. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, but back to Japan, uh, uh, what, what was uh, what was just Japan itself like? Like uh, the food, the culture, the people? Let me go to Japan. It's just, you know, I, I think it's just a lot more res- respectful type of society down there. I just more quiet type of society, respectful type of society, more education uh, driven uh, than what the United States is. Um, you know, food wise, I mean, I, I travel just fine. You know, I, you know, I travel different countries, and I, I, I put something down on a plate in front of me, 
I don't know what, what it is. I just look around. I see other people eat it. I figure, well, it, it, it's not going to kill them. I doubt it's going to kill me. <laughs> right. That's a good way to look at it. Uh, <clears throat> what's what? Just actually, when you're on the road like now, what what, what is your t- your favorite type of food? Well, I mean, like at the moment, I mean, it's, it's, I'm, I'm just trying to say, I've yeah. got uh, a canister of peanuts that I just munch that as I drive down the road. Um, I will uh, I will turn on talk radio. Mm-hmm. Um, just to to listen to the idiots that I'll probably have to listen to because it always kind of piss, piss me off a little bit. That, that's better than any cup of coffee. Uh. So that that'll, that'll seem to be true. I mean, I figure here it is, uh, 117. Uh, GPS still says that should be uh, getting into something about 730. I'm just hoping to pick up a little bit more time to that because uh, I don't want to be hitting any kind of... Uh, Rush hour traffic. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's going to be a, a Friday morning by the time I get into the uh, the, the Tulsa, Oklahoma area. So I'm hoping to keep the time going, shave up a few more minutes mm-hmm. as I'm going there. So the closer, closer to seven I can do it, the better I would like it. Mm-hmm. I'll get, I'll so, get a chance to lay my head down for a few hours before my very first assistant be picked up by, I think, 12 15. And I'll be speaking at a uh, boys' home and going out to state uh, after state after state until I think my day ends at 1 o'clock in the morning. Wow. Okay, yeah. now, again, is that what, is that what a 60 year old guy does? <laughs> Should we you? That's He's done impressive. 12 hours and then he's good. Yeah, yeah no, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's what you do. It's, it's, well, I always tell people that the word is called sacrifice, or what is the price that you're willing to pay for success? Mm-hmm. That's actually the name of, the, of my professional estate company. Um, it's just a little small company I've got. It's, it's called GOG, which stands for Christ of Glory. And I did not come up with that name. I asked my wrestlers. I said, after I've been trained this guy for a while, and, we were just, and I, I just was pointed with the idea of coming up with a little professional estate organization because Become a, become a professional wrestler is twofold. Any good trade is half the battle. The second half of the battle is working out a promotion. You're, you're, you're an adult person. So I thought, well, I'll just start my own promotion. I'll just start running shows so that, that we could simply just uh, record matches and now these guys could have you know, something that uh, they use as they set off to different promoters to show their work to fill it. So I asked my students, and I want you guys to come up with a date. And uh, after my week, I think you said to be with POG, and I'm like, Pog? What the heck is Pog? And they're like, no, Christ of glory. And then they start saying how I quote from the time. You know, are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to go run that physical lift? You know, you pay the price for the you're paying monthly dues. You pay the price and uh, and uh, as athletic in blood, sweat, tears. Are you willing to pay the price? Pay the price, but are you also willing to sacrifice all the time away from family and friends? Most are the most will not ever pay that price. Only a couple, close. No, but they'll talk a good game. And I've encountered more and more talkers than I have. Doers. So, um, you mentioned, you know, some people who passed away, uh, over the years and, uh, what are your memories of Chris Candido and, you know, wrestling him, uh, to, to win the, the NWA title and, uh, I mean, just him as a person. I mean, just, uh, you know, very, very topical, uh, person, very easy to uh, it was, you know, I, I did not really know him at the time that we did the match, but, you know, but, uh, after that, Got to know him more and more, you know, because we, we, we bump into each other on, on other shows and, and uh, don't get a chance to know each other. So it was just kind of a shame to see him pass away at such a young age, you know, because of a kind of a blunt, 
blood clots or blood disease or whatever he had going to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was sad That's because right. it was it was uh, it was after he he had got clean, and then just kind of a freak thing that that he passed away yep. from. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, w- w- did you enjoy your time in Smoky Mountain? Well, I was only only there really for the for the one show. Okay. Well, did you enjoy the one show at Smoky Mountain? I guess. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it's right. I mean, well, I'll say that professional I think makes me nervous. Mm-hmm. That's I mean, as I as ironic as that may sound, Jack. Uh, professional I still makes me nervous. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, you know, I. I I, I've had I've had doctors that should check my heart rate before walking into a cage, and they're like, they had to check a couple times. And I go, the heart rate should not be this, should not be this calm. And I just told myself I can handle a shoot. I, that's most of my life has been a shoot. It's the way that I have to fill a window of time. I have to tell a story that I'm not good at. Have you, um, why, why do you think you're, is it just, it's just not your thing? Why do you think that's like, uh, something that you've, well, uh, got, you just not excelled at? Just because my, my average was clear was so much, it's, 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 it's so long. You know, mm-hmm. I said, you know, I started that in 1969 and have I ever really stopped it? No, I have not. Mm-hmm. And that, that was the hardest thing to mentality, uh, wise was. I no longer have an opponent. I have a partner. Mm-hmm. You know, as before, you know, I would be in a foreign, uh, foreign country. I, I'm used to being booed because America is hated by most countries because of all the, all the opportunity that we have that they don't have. So I've, I've always been good to tune it out the audience to where there's just my opponent and I. I don't even think about the referee, or I should say referees, because at international competition, you have three referees. And typically, they don't like America, so they're going to be ripping you off on uh, point. And calls, and for passivity, and things of that nature. So I had to rewire myself in a lot of ways to, now I have to listen for the crowd, because again, it depends on, I work at a northern, a professional company, a good northern state, southern state, east coast, west coast, because the clouds are different. What they buy it. So, <clears throat> difficult in that aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, do you get the, what's the difference um, just um, for you performing in front of a, um, a wrestling crowd uh, as opposed to uh uh, UFC MMA crowd, like, uh, do you get the same feeling from from the crowd? No, it's uh, it's, it's it's different. I mean, the MMA crowd, oh, I mean, it's it's they don't get. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to say this. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, the the people are going to be the regardless. Professionals, the crowd, they're they're looking they're looking for certain attributes. Again, it's just all the pairs of these you know, yeah, Professional seat, it's a it's a three week circus with a side freak show. You know, so you know, you got tank matches, single matches, you got high flyers, you got the scientific wrestlers, you, you know, and everything in between. So it just all depends on what you're looking for. But usually at a professional show you should find at least a match or two that you really enjoy watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what? Are, are there any wrestlers that uh, when you started to get into it? I know you you grew, you said you watched um, um, like the Sheik and stuff. Yeah, but were, yeah. were there any were well, there any wrestlers that you kind of uh, that you um, that you enjoyed the most or kind of or pattern your style after it all? No, not really. I mean, it was uh, I, I wore the same outfit. I, I was kind of just wanted to go out there trying to make my own mark as as an individual and. Uh, you know, it, just, it, it was basically like a continuation for me from, from the UFC to, you know, professional. But at the same time, most people 
that's what they assumed, but it was as of the 92 Olympics, I was first a professional wrestler as of 1992. UFC did not even come into existence until December 1993. Mm-hmm. So as a professional wrestler first, I won the MWA belt first. Mm-hmm. And it was the first time that uh, you know, the uh, MWA belt was carried out to the octagon at UFC number five. Dennis Carluso carried it out. And after I won that tournament, I held up both belts inside the, the octagon. And rest assured, the UFC ownership at that point in time really did not want to have anything to do with professional wrestling. But I had to assure them that I wasn't a clown in the professional wrestling industry. I was a throwback from days gone by. And that is what most people would say to me. Well, that is, in fact, I should have been wrestling in the you know, probably 50s or 40s because of you know what I look like and what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, in the background with mm-hmm. the likes of Luthas. Mm-hmm. Did you ever meet Luthas? Multiple times. First time was going to Japan and working for the UWFI. Multiple mm-hmm. times doing that. And then inside the uh, United States, same way there, going to the uh, Polyflower Alley uh, banquets. Yeah. Lou was the president, and actually he is uh, the person who uh, uh, gave me uh, my own special NWA belt for all the things that I, I did for the NWA organization. Mm-hmm. Well, that's pretty awesome. So what was he like as a, as a person? Well, you gotta realize I, I bet Lou when he was probably in his mid-70s. Yeah. So, uh, I think, yeah, he, he still had a big old darling grip, grip on him for that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he, uh, I think the first time I was over in Japan. And, of course, I, I did that good enough for the world. But I was out there, you know, drilling and working, and, uh, he, he made a couple of comments. I mean, I, I'll say just rather uh, nice comments are about <laughs> the mechanics right. that I was doing. Mm-hmm. So the um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, what NWA is doing currently. Uh, Billy Corgan uh, has recently bought it. Um, do you have any connection at all to to the NWA currently? No. Would you be interested in doing anything with them? Uh, it all depends on how it be used. I, I think Brian is how it be used. You know, so mm-hmm. if they're the most with the right type of opportunity, sure. Yeah. Um, how, how about uh, I mentioned the earlier how you're doing physically? How about uh, concussions? You know, that's obviously a big thing in the last few years in sports. Uh, did you ever suffer any concussions, and how are you doing there? Well, I'm sure I have. Probably my first of those were probably in my high school football days. Mm-hmm. I was a three sport athlete: I had the ball, football, winter time wrestling, straight time, track, and field. And I also wrestled freestyle wrestling through, through that same period that, that took most of the summer. And the track coach knew that if there was a Saturday wrestle beat and a Saturday track beat, he was not going to see me at the track beat. And he was mad about that because I would always get a point for shot, this, for throwing the shot put or for run the high hurdles or something like that. So I was actually uh, not bad at the hurdles. So, um, where, where, where would you have got the, uh, the, the, the concussions at that time? It's, it's, it's football. Mm-hmm. The equipment wasn't as good as what the equipment is today. It, it was, uh, canvas style, heavy plastic type helmets. You know, what, yeah. what the whole, all air pad and the way that they are now, but I'm sure I probably, uh, something, a couple of concussions at that point in time. So I remember mm-hmm. one specific moment, no, but uh, if if you if you have, uh, I actually have busted helmets 
in football games and had to wear another uh, football player's helmet just to finish out a game. Mm-hmm. So he must be doing either something right or something wrong if you're splitting the helmet or mm-hmm. making some rather heavy connections. Yeah. Uh, I love what, actually I love I love football more than I did wrestling, but uh, you know, as uh, football, you had to rely on ten out of ten of the players to do their job, and I know that I did, I did my job. I think that was what did my my last. It was going to go down or it was going to get blocked out, but uh, others would miss blocks with this tackles, and then uh, you would lose as a team. Well, the definition of wrestling is team sport based upon individual performances. The team could lose, and I could still win. I chose wrestling because of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, how about your parents? Uh, 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 were they encouraging uh, for, for you to go into wrestling and then and, and play a lot of sports? Uh, no, I actually uh, because I grew up on a farm. And, uh, I, mean, I think they wanted to be proud of it, but they, they, I guess they just didn't realize how well we would take to uh, the sport of wrestling. I say it like that because I I am the second oldest out of eight children. I have four of the brothers, three sisters. Out of the five bell combination, all five of us went to college on full athletic scholarships, and all three females went to college on almost all full academic scholarships. So I like to think that I have a jock with a brain, which is kind of a, more of a rarity nowadays. Uh-huh. Uh, some uh, questions here on on my Facebook page. Uh, Sergio San- Sandoval wants to know uh, if uh, who do you think would win between you and Brock Lesnar in UFC in your prime? And, okay. I'm glad he distinguished it in our prime. Mm-hmm. The UFC never saw me in my prime. The UFC saw me a decade after my time. Mm-hmm. And my time was from 1984 to 1986. I ruled the world. So, to know that by 1996, I'm the number one cage fighter in the world of a decade past my time. No doubt in my mind what would have happened. Oh, I, no. do I need to point out the fact that he also tested positive in his last match? Mm-hmm. No, what, what do you think? Like his, his comments, though, before, here before, where he was repeatedly asked to use steroids, his comment was always, I had never tested positive. And it was actually, that wasn't the question. But right. it, it was a truthful answer that he gave them. So I, I appreciate that, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, though? If someone tests positive, um, but then they go through the fight anyway, uh, should the test be done before the fight and, like, the results found before they actually fight? Well, again, that just all depends on the organization. If you do, okay, for example, try Try to care what you did. <laughs> right. So, you know, that's a, it's a site for UFC. They're, they're the way to do it. It's, uh, you know, just look at bodybuilding. I mean, I know it's not quite a safe comparison, but, but there's two different divisions in bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. There's the natural level bodybuilders, and then there's the pro level bodybuilders. These natural bodybuilders look like 98-pound weaklings compared to the pro because of you know, you gotta look at all the stuff these pros are taking. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, monstrous. If, if you've ever been to the Arnold Schwarzenegger Classic held at Columbus, Ohio, I think it's every March, I don't know, second or third week of March, it is the biggest freak show in the world. I've been there a num- number of times. I'd be behind the... Uh, you behind the table, I feel music done on display, thinking that I'm one of the freaks that's on display that these people are to see, but at the same token, of course, I'm standing at the table watching all the freaks pass by that they've got 
arms like gorillas. They got the hind quarters like like a, a horse or something like this. You know, and I'm, I'm talking about the females. I'm not even talking about the guys yet. You know, you got uh, chicks that if they did shave or, or, or they felt like, uh, how's it going? You know, I think it's, where that place just come from, from, from Pina <laughs> over here. Uh-huh. It's, it's, a, it's a freak show. It's, it is, it's, uh, I brought a couple of my friends to it, and they were thoroughly entertained. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you you mentioned there about uh, about your prime was in the mid '80s there. So um, if UFC had been around then, uh, you you definitely think that would have been something you would have pursued. I don't know. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's hard to say. It, 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 that that opportunity was not there. Uh, had mm-hmm. had everything gone had everything gone the way it should have gone, maybe in an amateur career, you and I would not be speaking there tonight. I would have been tired. Back in 1984, I would have won Olympic gold medal. I would have retired, and I'd be probably some professor, instructor, or high school teacher slash coach. That's where I'd be out of the But because some things did not go the way I anticipated, well, I had to rewrite my my goals and to, to set my sights on something to do. Mm-hmm. Always been kind of a goal oriented as an individual. Uh, Daniel Dale Herring wants to know what are your thoughts on the evolution of MMA, uh, and what do you think of uh, mainstream sports media's view on it? Well, I mean, uh, the, the sport has evolved immensely. You know, there is really no longer, at least not at the pro level, there's no longer the the what what the dimensional athlete, you know. And I throw myself in that same category. There's no longer just the boxer, just the wrestler. You have grapplers that can strike with the best of the strikers, and you have strikers that can grapple with the best of the grapplers. So you have a very well rounded athlete. You know, you got to realize the sport has been around, what, 20, 21, 22 years now? Mm-hmm. So it involved, you know, people who uh, are starting kids at very young ages doing things. Because they're hoping to uh, mold them into uh, a mixed martial artist somewhere down the road. So, in that essence, you have a much more greater opponent, uh, uh, I should say, greater athlete. You know, each year or every couple of years, you see like there's one new rule that comes in, into play. You know, with, like in the very beginning of the interview, he talked about. Uh, you know, those aren't you know, only have the two rules that don't like you like us. And in the modern mixed martial arts today, it's either 47 or 49 rules. And I think that eventually that the elbow is going to be taken out of mixed martial arts just because it's a big cutting tool. It cuts a lot of people. It is bad just because, you know, just because they can't see. They think they're, you know, eyebrow cut. Mm-hmm. And he also asked, "Well, what do you think um, about uh, mainstream sports media's uh, outlook on on MMA? How do they how do they look at it? How do they treat it?" I think they look upon it as an anti contest. No longer really the the big shows that it was at one point died. Very mm-hmm. very very controversial when it first began. Of two bad private into cage. Now it's because it's been around long enough. It's you know, it has to, to society. You know, you, at, at the, you know, if you go back to that 1993 uh, period of time, there was only one cage that was owned by the old by exception. You know, fast forward to today again, you can go into almost any small town community and you'll have some gym that might have a small cage or at least a couple of sections of that prop, you know, propped up against the wall and they're, they're teaching cage wall tactics or, or octagon this or that. And, uh, you know, most of these people can't even spell MMA, let alone do it. Uh-huh. Uh, let's see here. Steven Thomas wants to know, uh, what did you think of WWF Brawl for All? It's always a complete value. <laughs> uh-huh. It was, actually. 
Hey, man, just as a fan, it was it was a uh, it was a, it was bad. Well, I mean, it was supposed to be an introduction for Steve, Doctor Death, Steve Williams. Uh huh. And it, you know, it's it's it, it, uh, that's not it's it, it's kind of tough to be trying to manipulate an outcome in a real contest. That's why professional wrestling is what it is, and real athletic contests are what they are. Uh, well, what did you think of Dr. Death? Uh, did you know him at all? No, a very colorful individual. I mean, I remember uh, watching him. It is, uh, you know, there's a dual beat of Arizona State going up against uh, Oklahoma University and uh, even his old home crowd. This was actually takes place in Oklahoma. And the crowd is boo with him, and he's just there standing there blowing him kisses. I kept thinking, well, he was, he was a worker even way back then. Real rough, tough uh, football player, too, from what I, I was told. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see here. Uh, uh, Clint Williams wants to know, uh, what what was it like to have Jim Cornette managing you in his last, uh, ma- his last uh, match as a manager? Well, I mean, I just kind of thought that was a uh, very, uh, uh, I guess I was honored the fact that he chose to manage me. And you know, as he was going through, when, the, when he told the promoter that this was going to be his last, and the promoter says, well, who do you want to manage? And, and, and uh, she just asked him, to, uh, he said, well, who's all on the show? He started going through my life, but he came to my name, he says, I just said that I want to manage Dan. But the promoter told me that. I actually had something else I was going to be doing that same week before. But the promoter told me that. I just I changed states and I, and I, I went did the, the show because you know, I, I felt that much in regards to uh, Jim Cornette for what all he was trying to do for me. Because he went to bat for me time and time again, especially mm-hmm. at the, well, at my time with WAF. And, you know, he said that they don't have a clue what to do with you. He said that you're the greatest thing ever hit professional wrestling because you're a, you're a, you're a wrestler who can actually <laughs> wrestle, not just a pose and flex, cut silly promos. You can actually wrestle. Did, in, in, during that time when you were in WWF, did they promise you anything? Like, like this is what we're going to do with you? Uh, you know, you're going to be at so and so, so many pay-per-views or win any titles or anything, or, or didn't they promise you anything, you know, concrete like that? I mean, in, in the initial contract, uh, the, I, the thing is, I did not work 187 days. That's what they were, you know, I mean, that's what their standard contract was. And I wanted my freedom to do whatever else I wanted to do. The, the, the WWF did not know how old I was. Mm-hmm. I just, I just, didn't tell, I didn't tell people. I mean, I could easily pass for you know a much younger person, mm-hmm. and so basically, all my conversation was taking place with Jim Knight, and Jim, Jim Knight hit it off just fine. And uh, you know, basically, when I when I finally in the office, you know, the contracts already been agreed to and stuff like that. You know, well, you know, well, we're at shakes, slap it on the back, blah blah blah. Except for the yuck yucks. Uh, a few other days were going to be a set that uh, finally did say, well, well, how old are you exactly? And I told him 48. And uh, this looks right at uh, Jim Ross. So, who's our oldest rookie ever met? And Jim just points the cigarette back at me and goes, Dan, but he did not look my age, nor did I act my age. Um, what, what was Owen Hart like? Did he, uh, he's notorious for playing any ribs. Uh, I don't know if someone would, would probably wouldn't be smart to play rib on, on Dan to be severed, but, uh, do you have any memories of Owen Hart? No, I mean, no, Owen would have pulled, pulled one of me. He, he, after he found out, I mean, I, I'm actually pretty good day to take individual of that, but, uh, yeah. you know, I, I got to know the, the Hart family more and more, I guess, as time progressed at the beginning, you know, just superficially, mm-hmm. but, you know, with, uh, you know, watching Owen, you know, especially when he did the Blue Blazer gimmick, he really enjoyed that character. He just, you could see the mischievousness 
coming out with them. You know, that, that, that smile and stuff like that. You know, then, uh, there was travel and ski uh, at, at uh, the home of his parents. You know, when they were doing the, the Dutch match down in the basement. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, you know while, while that's being all set up, I just sit up at the room and I'm uh, listening to his father, Stu, just freaking out with various types of stories and stuff like that. It, and, uh, you know, it's basically, you know, ask me a few different questions. But, you know, it's basically, I guess, something that's a little bit that about my, little bit of my shooting background, stuff like that. Because he asked me some very specific questions. All I know is, like, basically about a week later, Owen presented me with, it was actually an Owen Hart T-shirt, but his father had signed it for me. Oh, nice. Just something about my dad actually really enjoyed you know, he just talked to you and he wanted you to have this. I thought, oh, that was, that was a great, you know, and even from that point on, I mean, I, I bumped into a few of the other hearts and, and, uh, you know, like, for example, whenever I saw Brett, if I knew Brett was going to be at a, a show or something like this, I'd go out, I'd go out of my way to come over and see him, shake his hand, you know, just chit chat with him for a few minutes and he did the exact same thing in, in reverse to me, but he found out I was at something and he was going to be there, so, so I really got the chance to. I think that's. I think that's what they appreciated. It, it, it's not that I was getting closer because of, of who they are. I just was getting closer for how they treat. That, that's a sure. world of difference. There's a lot of. That's what it looked at. I always say that professional asset is probably. Oh, that probably it is the absolute worst industry. I have never ever been involved in as a broad stroke. I've met some wonderful individuals along the way, but as a broad stroke, the absolute worst industry ever. Why is that? It, it doesn't follow some of the most basic principles of business 101. And uh, people will step on you or expose you just because they think that they could it will help them uh, move their careers along. Mm-hmm. Do you have any specific incidences? Well, sure, but I'm not, not, not going to talk about right now. So sure. I'll let, I'll let, I'll let, certain, I'll let some, certain six dogs lie. That's what comes mm-hmm. with me. I, 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 could, I don't care. But. Mm-hmm. And like you said, it's, it's more just uh uh, almost an, a norm in, the, in 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 wrestling as opposed to uh, certain individuals. But um, d- did you uh, did you ever have any talks with ECW? And Paul uh, Heyman. A little bit. Actually, it was at the very first pay per view that uh, ever took place. Oh, the barely legal. I don't don't remember which one it was, but I was at the, actually the very first pay per view. I was actually up at their. Uh, the uh, the the real area was talking with the family and stuff like that. He actually came up with all kinds of crazy ideas, but at the same time, it's kind of like, well, I'm just here right now and just kind of watch, observe it. And that sounds about it. Yeah. Uh, do you remember when uh, they they brought in uh, Paul Varlins uh, for for a little? Well, I think for just one show. For, uh, for, for, for former. Uh, ECW brought in uh, UFC fighter Paul Paul Varlins. No, no, yeah, no. That's that, that, you know, it, again. I, I just there, there just was a certain point in time. I think when it was all started, my life got so busy, Jack, that uh, watching TV was not even an it, 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 it equation whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, you realize. I've got a fighting career. I've got a professionalistic career. I'm not exclusive to anybody. I'm on the road 20 some odd days. A month. I'm waking up. I'm driving long, crazy hours. I'm waking up. Sometimes as I'm probably to sleep on my eyes, I look around and I'm thinking, where am I at? And what is my function today? And I actually have to, I have to look at my, my plan. My, my planner looked just to realize, okay, I, I'm just doing an amateur SMS. Oh, 
I, 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 they were both top today. Oh, I got five to two cage. Oh, professional wrestling. That's, that's how crazy of a life I've had for <laughs> quite a few years. Mm-hmm. It, 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 as, as I tell that to you, what am I doing right now? How many people are going to lay down a 12 hour drive? <laughs> uh-huh. uh, then, I mean, what do you as th- it is, as it is, we've been on this interview well over an hour now. Yeah, yeah, I think we might. Well, let me check here. I get the exact time. Uh, yeah, over an hour and a half. So, uh, well, what are your thoughts on Bellator? Uh, well, I mean, just another, I thought they promotion to be there. They're probably, we'll say that some of that's been trouble. They try to try more crazier ideas than, than anybody else. Up to the point that they've even had a fast man inside the cage. Mm-hmm. Now, where do where do you see the future of uh, Bellator going? Oh, I don't. I, I, I don't pay enough attention to anything. <laughs> fair to fair enough. On what what uh-huh. direction that they're, they're going to? I mean, <laughs> Jack, I never watched the UFC. <laughs> uh-huh. I, uh-huh. I never watched it during the time I was there. I, I, I still don't watch I, I always have watched this last one just because I went there with told my son this past weekend I was in Detroit. I went to watch a UFC. But and even then, I watch it my sons more than I have watched that because I've seen expressions on their face, see how great it is that they're there seen it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To me it's like I want I I've shared it their excitement only because I'm watching them. Mm-hmm. Uh, do they have any interest in, in getting into it? No. No, I've, uh, I kept that part of my life very secretive mm-hmm. uh, to my family. Uh, I, I didn't tell a single family member when I was going to do my very first one, but it, it's because of uh, cell phones, because of the social media, that it's hard to keep it yeah. secret nowadays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, so the internet. They, thought, they, awesome. they found out really from their friends that uh, you know, like my, my, my oldest son, he's uh, he was in third grade when I was uh, starting all this stuff, and a group of boys had to have a professional wrestling magazine, and they all stand around there, they're just on the page at the page, going oohs and ahs, and then uh, they flip the page once, and my son played the tentacles. That's my dad. And the teacher was standing there, and he just kind of pats my son Michael by the head there and goes, so, 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 Michael, that's your pop. Well, two weeks later, for show and tell. Guess what my son brought in for show and tell? <laughs> he brought his dad in. <laughs> and uh, the teacher told me the story, and he says, I go, I said, get the last thing, can I help you out at all there on that one? <laughs> he said, well, it's just, yeah, so I just, yeah, it was it was it was all good. Yeah, I, I, still kept, I just wanted my kids to know me as dad. Although dad was gone an awful lot, and I always <laughs> told that was off off wrestling. I never told my dog off fighting to go. I didn't want to go to worry about beer, get hurt or something like that. I just I'm going through this one of these wrestling matches. <laughs> so, well, where did the name the Beast come from? Who? When was the first time you used it? Who gave it to you? Jim Brown, a legendary football player, Jim Brown. Oh, wow. He was one of the play by play uh, complicators for the UFC for, I think, half a dozen other shows back in the old part era. For people that would like to, that would like to be uh, trained by you, uh, where would they find that information? Oh, they could uh, simply find just go to my website at www. DanSever.com. DanSever.com. All my social medias are there. They can contact me through, uh, you know, whether it's Facebook or I think uh, my office number is all up there as well. They can contact me, email me, and uh, I can, you know, give us more information. You know, I have a very unique paint facility on my property and uh, my old data that I'll never be done with it. I'll be that. Uh, 80 some year old guy that's uh, walking across the lawn with a cane there one day and uh, 
to you, but so probably uh, you're scared to cross. So like, hey, you can't get over there. And they'll, what, we'll look at the other one, and they'll say, well, who's that? And uh, the other kid will say, well, legend has it. He used to be somebody. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I appreciate you doing this. It's been it's been a great time talking to you, and I hope uh, I hope I made your drive a little uh, took a few hours off of it anyway. Yep, yep. You did this, Jack. So when you uh, when you get ready to, to post this, uh, you know, contact me uh, through uh, whether Facebook or something like this, and uh, share it with me. And I'll share it to my other got six of my Facebook pages alone. So you know, also awesome. some, some feed attention out of it. Very cool. I appreciate that. This is Vince Russo, everybody, and you are listening to In Your Head, Bro.